let's start with a quick poll. Please raise your hand if you punched someone today. No? Very good. Me neither. Actually, I've never punched anyone. But I'd like to tell you about a time I came really close. A few years ago, my husband took me to a Red Sox-Yankees game at Yankee Stadium. <laughs> oh, so you know where this is going already. OK. My husband is a big Red Sox fan, so he was wearing his Sox cap. I'm not really a fan of either team. Sorry, Red Sox fans. But I enjoy the psychology and spectacle of sporting events. <laughs> oh, yes. So before the game and during the first few innings, a couple of Yankees fans commented on my husband's hat, made good-natured jokes about the way that the game would go, and he heckled them back. It was all in good fun. But as the innings wore on and the scores remained close, the interactions between the Yankees fans and my husband became noticeably more hostile. I saw my husband's patience wearing thin, so I simply took the hat from him. I didn't have anywhere to stash it, so I put it on. Naively, I assumed that I wouldn't get into any trouble. I mean, A, I'm not even a hardcore fan, and B, I certainly wasn't going to start anything with anyone. I could not have been more wrong. I won't repeat the nasty things that some of these Yankees fans said to me, but I withstood it for maybe 10 minutes before I was screaming back, and eventually my husband had to stand between me and a Yankees fan. <laughs> I mean, how crazy is that? I just told you I don't even care about baseball. And yet, I'm willing to bet that many of you, in some situation, have wanted to react in a similar manner. So why did this situation have this effect on me? because of a fundamental component of human nature, the tendency to draw bright boundaries between us and them. The good news is, these responses are flexible. We're not hapless victims of our evolution or our environments. If we're aware of the factors that make us more prone to attacking and harming people from other groups, we may be less subject to those factors. Before we get there, though, we need to understand better what makes people, or me, behave this way. Simply acting as a member of a group changes how people behave. In other words, people's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors towards other changes when the social context shifts from me and you to us and them. So where does this tendency come from in the grand scheme? If we look back in our evolutionary histories, our ancestors reaped numerous material and psychological benefits from being able to cooperate and identify with fellow group members. These benefits included protection, pooled resources, and a satisfaction of the psychological need to belong. Those who were better at identifying and cooperating with fellow group members reaped more benefits. But the flip side of this tendency to draw boundaries between us and them is that group life also has significant costs. Group living produces pressure to conform with in-groups, sometimes making us do and say things we don't otherwise want to do and say. It's also the source of intractable conflict between groups. But that was our ancestors. Where does intergroup strife come from today? Groups continue to change how people behave because they change people's expectations of what's appropriate. It's almost like people have a different template, a more aggressive template, for group-on-group group as compared to one-on-one -on -one interactions. Remember, I walked into that baseball stadium completely indifferent. But the second I put that cap on, I marked my supposed group membership. I didn't have any personal beef with the Yankees fans, but they created it in me because they treated me like a member of Red Sox Nation. Because they did that, I took on that Red Sox identity. I wasn't acting as an individual anymore. I was acting as a representative of Red Sox fans. Now, decades of social psychological research reveal that I am not unique in this regard. People remember group-on-group -group interactions as being more aggressive than one-on-one -on -one interactions. 
For example, if you ask people to keep a diary of all of their social interactions and then ask them to remark on how those interactions went, say, a business meeting, people reliably report that their group-on-group -group interactions are significantly more abrasive than their one-on-one -on -one interactions. People also rate ongoing group-on-group -group interactions as being more competitive and less cooperative than their one-on-one -on -one interactions. And this is true even when groups are not in competition. Finally, people expect group-on-group -group interactions that have yet to take place to be more aggressive than one-on-one -on -one interactions. Now, these findings probably dovetail with your own past experience. I mean, if you think about it, ever since you were a little kid, more often than not, being split up into groups meant that one group was competing against the other. It's not so surprising, then, that people have this template in their heads. So does this template actually impact our behavior? Absolutely. People behave more aggressively in groups as compared to alone. Consider a situation in which you bring two individuals or two groups of three people together. You tell them that they, either as individuals or as groups, are going to have to make a choice about how to interact with one another. Across dozens of studies, psychologists find that people cheat more often in games when they play as teams as compared to alone. Now, this extends even to situations in which people are asked to physically harm others. In the lab, people will assign other people to drink more painfully hot hot sauce when they make the decision as a group as opposed to alone. What is it about groups that allows this to happen? I mean, why do groups change how we behave? At least three factors contribute to increased aggression between groups, though I should note this is not an exhaustive list. First, groups allow us to reframe immoral behavior as being critical for achieving our own group's goals. Said another way, sometimes we tell ourselves that being a good group member means being a jerk to the other group. But second, groups also allow for the diffusion, diffusion or displacement of responsibility for harmful behavior. When we act as part of a group, we feel less personally responsible for bad outcomes. Finally, groups may cause us to lose touch with our moral compasses. We may get swept up in the excitement of acting as part of a group, which then makes it harder to pay attention to whether or not we're adhering to our personal moral standards. Now, this last factor is extremely difficult to study and to measure. As researchers, we can't simply ask people if they've lost touch with their personal moral codes, because the second we do, we draw their attention to it. So what my colleagues and I really wanted to figure out was what's going on inside people's heads when they act as members of groups. By employing a combination of psychological and neuroscience approaches, we set out to observe the seemingly unobservable. If you design your experiments well, functional neuroimaging can provide you with an online, unobtrusive measure of ongoing psychological processes. In our case, we used MRI to measure the changes in blood flow in people's brains. Now, this technique allows us to see which brain regions are more active when participants are doing our specific task as compared to some baseline. And in our case, we were interested in this particular region, the medial prefrontal cortex and pregenual anterior cingulate. I'll call it MPFC for short. Just for frame of reference, this region is located a couple of centimeters behind the center of your forehead. Now, the MPFC is associated with self-referential processing, which is just a fancy way of saying thinking about oneself. This region is also associated with many other tasks and processes, but across several studies, the MPFC is more active when people think about their own as compared to another's mental states, traits, and physical characteristics. The MPFC is more active when people read words and facts that are related to themselves, like your name or the name of the street that you grew up on. You may be wondering at this point, what on earth does this region have to do with groups? Well, if people's personal moral codes really become less accessible when they act as a member of a group, one might expect to see less MPFC activity when they read about their own moral behaviors in a group context. So with our experiment, we tested exactly this. We wanted to see if people showed less MPFC activation when they read sentences about their own behavior in the context of a competitive team relative to when they read these sentences alone. 
So we brought people into the lab one by one, and we assigned them to one of two teams competing for cash. We placed them inside the MRI scanner, and we had them read a series of statements about moral and social behavior. For example, a moral behavior might be something like, I've stolen food from a shared refrigerator. Whereas a social statement might be something like, I have a Facebook account. And we told our participants that their task was actually a game, and their job was to push a button as quickly as possible when they saw a social statement and withhold a response otherwise. We didn't label the moral items moral, we just called them distractors. Finally, we told participants, you're going to play this game two times, once alone and once surrounded by nine of your teammates. We told them that nine of their teammates were coming back into the lab in order to be able to play the game with them in real time from a room across the hallway. Now, what people saw was actually this pre-recorded video, but what's important is that they believed that their teammates were there playing alongside them in real time. After they finished the two games, we pulled them out of the scanner and we said, as a last favor to us, could you please just help us select photographs of your teammates and competitors? We've received permission from these people to publish these online, to distribute them to the media, and to disseminate them to the public more broadly. What participants didn't know was that we had already had a separate group of people rank order these photos from most to least attractive. Now imagine this guy is competing with your group. Which picture should I select for the entire world to see? Maybe this one? As predicted, People who showed less MPFC activity when reading about their own moral behavior in a group context also picked nastier photos of their competitors relative to their teammates. <laughs> Ruthless. So there are two caveats here. The first is that we ran several other analyses to bolster our confidence that this pattern of data is indeed related to reduced thinking about the self in the group context. And second, it's very important to note that this is just one study with a small sample. We have a lot more work to do to better understand how this phenomenon unfolds in the real world with much more consequential forms of aggression. But tentatively, one possible interpretation of these results is that people who lost themselves in the group were also more ruthless to their competitors. Now, you may be thinking at this point, does this really matter outside of the lab? I mean, is this really a problem for me? I don't go around punching people. Yes. Left unchecked, these group-related tendencies have massive social consequences. Intergroup conflict has been called one of the greatest problems facing the world today. By some counts, the last century has seen over 200 million people killed in acts of genocide, war, and other forms of aggression. Though it has decreased in recent decades, intergroup violence continues to afflict communities from here in Boston and all over the country to countless countries worldwide. This tendency is even reflected in our ever increasingly combative political landscape. Our government is presently the most polarized it's been in decades. Now, some of these statistics are devastating, but there's another challenge that stands between us and reducing this problem. It's how we think about who is responsible. When we chalk conflict up to just a few bad apples, we completely neglect the fact that when we act as part of a group, whether it's our national identity, our religion, our political affiliation, we may become more likely to aggress as well. Now, what makes this problem so insidious, but also so interesting, goes back to how hard it is to see that it's happening, what it's happening to us. Take me, for example. It wasn't until I got home from that Red Sox-Yankees game that I began to even understand why I had become so aggressive. In that moment, even I didn't realize what was happening, and I study this for a living. Now, my Red Sox-Yankees adventure is mostly funny story, but think instead about ongoing clashes between protesters and police in places like Ferguson that have been going on for over a year how wearing riot gear and treating a group of peaceful protesters like an angry mob can create that angry mob. So if it's so hard to check ourselves in the minute, 
are we doomed to be horrible to one another? No, we're not doomed. And our best strategies for reducing conflict between groups may lie with the individuals who make up those groups. First, think back to the fMRI study I just told you about. It's extremely important to note that not everybody showed that effect. In other words, people who didn't show reduced MPFC activity in the group context also did not aggress against their competitors. Now, other researchers have found that when you tell people that their behavior within groups is going to be made public and specifically linked to them, they aggress less. So the results of our and others' research suggest that one way to get people to aggress less in intergroup conflict is to make them think about themselves as individuals rather than just as group members. And this is an idea that my lab is continuing to work on now. Second, there are a lot of extremely potent impulses that we experience as individuals that lead to good behavior and cooperation. When we are face-to-face, one-on-one, we experience strong drives to be fair, to share resources equitably, and to refrain from harming one another. This is true even for strangers. For example, in the lab, people will pay more money to protect other people that they've never met from receiving an electric shock rather than prevent electric shocks to themselves. Even rats will forego yummy treats like chocolate in order to help free a cage mate who's stuck in a see-through cylinder like this one. Now, this isn't even unique to innocent strangers or lab settings. Analysis of combat activity from the Civil War and World War I indicates that soldiers would shoot over the heads of enemy fighters rather than shoot to kill. The bottom line is that one-on-one, -on -one, the idea of hurting someone else is highly aversive to most of us. Finally, I absolutely have to stress that groups do not always lead to bad behavior. For example, group-oriented people can be swayed to donate more money to charity than individually-oriented people. In fact, people acting in groups together can often accomplish a great deal more good than individuals acting alone, as long as they share a constructive goal. So, where does that leave us? I would argue that we should be cautiously optimistic. Much of what I've told you about today suggests that what we need to try and do is harness all of those pro-social impulses we feel as individuals. That when conflict begins to spiral out of control, that we see the person across from us as a person, and not just a representative of their group. We've all been there. When you're facing someone from another group and you are seized by the impulse to harm them in some way, be it punching them at a baseball game, or sabotaging them at work, or even ignoring them at a party. What if instead you stopped and thought to yourself, would you do this if it was just you and this person alone? If your groups didn't exist? <laughs>